That's me, taking a shot of whiskey with a severed human toe in it. Yeah, you heard that right. A real severed human toe is in that whiskey, and I am drinking it. But I'm only doing it to cheer myself up because I blew out my own ankle so bad that I went into shock, vomited, and then had to be evacuated by helicopter. Oh, you, uh, you think there's a story there? All right, I'll tell you. The most beautiful place I've ever camped in my life is also the place that absolutely broke me physically and emotionally. But somehow it's also one of my favorite stories and a place that I am absolutely dying to return to. I had been dreaming of visiting Tombstone Territorial Park for years, and it took me about 15 attempts to finally land the funding to make it happen. It feels like an unspoken rule in my life that the longer I look forward to something, the more likely it is that things really don't go according to plan, but I wasn't going to pass up this opportunity, so, Autumn and I headed to Whitehorse, the capital city of the Yukon, in early September. Unfortunately, the only way to get to Tombstone is on the Dempster Highway, right next door to the town of Dawson City. Getting a rental car in Dawson is next to impossible, so we were stuck with flying into Whitehorse, renting a car, and then driving seven hours north on some of the most scenic, yet bumpy and chaotic roads I have seen in a long time. In fact, the Dempster Highway is such a famously nasty road that the rental car company charges an extra 1500 US dollars to drive their car on it. I wasn't sure if it was just exhaustion or getting molested by that bumpy road for seven hours, but by the time we arrived in Dawson City, I was legitimately feeling under the weather. So I'm not just sick, I am COVID positive. I don't feel great, but uh, we're all the way here. We're in the Arctic, I guess we're committed. Uh, I've been working on this for nearly a year now. I, I don't really wanna bail. Load it up on NyQuil. We're gonna give it a shot. There's really no better social distancing than literally isolating yourself in the wilderness. And plus I'm a very strong hiker to begin with. So we decided we'd keep our plans and give it a shot. Our first day on the trail was also the biggest. And although the trail into Grizzly Lake was only seven miles or so, it also features four and a half thousand vertical feet of climbing. We started off in the willows and trees and quickly climbed up and onto a spectacular mountain ridge. I was charmed by the Canadian version of trail building. And by trail building, I mean they vaguely suggest where a trail should be and good luck to you. We were already blown away by the views and little did we know this was probably the least beautiful part of the trail for the entire trip. We experienced just about every single type of weather you can name, and after about eight hours of hiking, we arrived at Grizzly Lake, a gorgeous campsite built on the terminal moraine of an extinct glacier. It was cold and snowy while we pitched our tent, so we didn't do much that night, but eat a quick dinner and then go to sleep, but we awoke to clear skies and legitimately one of the most incredible views I've ever seen from a campsite. Although views like this are so good that we'd be content to just sit here and stare for an entire day, this was probably the most grueling day of hiking for the entire trip, so we packed up early and hit the trail. Today's mission was hiking from Grizzly Lake to Divide Lake, a deceptively difficult portion of the trail that it claims to only be about five miles of hiking, but requires climbing Glissade Pass. This pass is perhaps the epitome of Yukon-style trail building. Although Canadians all speak English, they've unfortunately never learned the word switchback. And so this trail just goes straight the hell up and over this ridge. I'm not exaggerating when I say this is probably the steepest trail I've ever hiked. I am a type two lunatic, so I absolutely loved this, but I have to admit in inclement weather, when this turns to mud, it would be legitimately scary. I was still feeling pretty under the weather, so we took a moment at the top to eat some snacks, watch the world go by, and take some very epic photos of us looking wistfully off into the distance. The hike down the other side of the pass was genuinely fun. Equally steep compared to the up track, bordering on dirt skiing, but despite the incredible incline, the loose scree was very gentle on the knees and it made for a very quick and fun descent. And before we knew it, 
We were walking into Divide Lake in the early afternoon. Grizzly Lake the night before was a stunner, but Divide Lake is truly something from another planet. The fresh dusting of snow the night before, combined with the changing autumn leaves, was absolutely breathtaking. This was the last week of operation before the park closes down for the winter also, so the campsites were all relatively empty, and we got our absolute pick of the litter. We chose the most beautiful and scenic campsite we could find, and spent the evening shooting photos for our two main sponsors for this trip, Feathered Friends and Deuter. Between the amazingly comfortable backpacks and the incredible warmth of our jackets and sleeping bags, I really can't think of two better sponsors for a backpacking project. Because Tombstone Park is entirely located on delicate permafrost tundra, you're only allowed to pitch your tent on the pre-built raised platforms, which helps protect the landscape and your equipment. And furthermore, each campsite has permanent bear lockers for food and established canvas tents for cooking and eating, which dramatically reduces the impact that campers have on both the landscape and the local wildlife. Each campsite also has an established outhouse, which I think is, hands down, maybe the single most beautiful public restroom I've ever seen. I'm not saying I pooped extra just to spend time in there, but I'm not saying I didn't pretend once or twice. Exhausted and ready for sleep, I went to hop down off the platform for one last run to the outhouse before bed, when I found a surprise lurking in wait. Whoever had camped at this campsite prior to us had, for reasons I will never understand, decided to dig an enormous hole right next to the tent platform. I hadn't seen it earlier because I was standing on the other side of the platform while photographing Autumn in the tent, but I landed directly in this crater at this moment, and I rolled my ankle so far to the side that it actually became a multi-dimensional Mobius strip. Autumn didn't get any video of this event or the aftermath, probably because I was saying every bad word I've ever learned, but I asked Midjourney to render a visual representation of what this felt like. I knew immediately that this was bad because I instantly got lightheaded and then nauseous and started to lose consciousness. All the signs of having a very, very fun time. I climbed into my sleeping bag to stave off the intense shivers and slowly I started to feel better. Since it was already the end of the day, we decided to sleep it off and reevaluate in the morning. The next morning, my ankle was swollen and slightly bruised, but I was able to put weight on it, which seemed like a good sign that nothing was broken. We heard from other campers that there was a ranger at the next campsite, only about a four and a half mile hike away, so we figured if we could make it there, we could get input on our next steps. Autumn is a certified wilderness first responder, so she wrapped up my ankle safely. I do think it's worth mentioning that hiking on an injured ankle is very stupid, and I do not condone this behavior, but we were sort of between a rock and a hard place. With two good feet, this would have been a simple stroll, but with only one ankle and trying to use trekking poles as crutches, this four and a half mile walk took us almost five hours. About a mile from camp, a storm blew in that would end up lasting for several days, but we made it to camp and pitched our tents at the spectacular Talus Lake just as the storm was arriving. Our permits allowed for two nights at Talus Lake, so we spent the entire next day resting my ankle, letting it recover, waiting out the storm. And by our second afternoon there, the storm had finally broke. The ranger on duty, also named Nate, like every single cool person on the planet should be, offered to take us to his favorite overlook to watch sunset. I hobbled down the trail with him and Autumn, and we retreated to a sunset that I will absolutely never forget. Autumn and I had long chats with Ranger Nate about my ankle, and I was partially committed to attempting the hike out. I pride myself on being tough and resilient, and I didn't want to consume park resources that might be needed for someone in a true life-threatening emergency. It would suck and it would hurt, but I wasn't actually dying, you know? But 
Just then, Ranger Nate got word that there was another storm blowing in, this one heavy enough to close the park for the rest of the season. Nate informed us that a helicopter would be arriving the next day for a supply mission, and he strongly suggested that we get in it. Hiking over these passes in an Arctic blizzard is crazy to begin with, but with a dumb ankle, it pretty assertively crosses the line from tough to life-threateningly stupid, so we agreed. The last thing I want to do is be a burden on anyone else, and if I wasn't able to cross those passes in the storm, I wouldn't just be endangering myself, I'd be endangering Autumn and the entire search and rescue team as well, just to protect my own pride. I'm not gonna lie, getting on the helicopter hurt. It was the smartest move for the safety of myself and the park staff, but it did hurt my pride. Even sitting safe in the helicopter, knowing I wasn't gonna be hiking 20 miles on torn ligaments, all I could feel was sadness. This was a trip I'd been looking forward to for years, in possibly the single most beautiful place I'd ever camped, and I only got to do half the trip. We hadn't completely failed, of course. We took some beautiful photos, we made some great friends, and saw some jaw-dropping sights, but sitting in the back of that helicopter, flying over the very peaks that claimed my foot, felt like a complete failure. Later that evening, back in Dawson City, we headed to the world-famous Sourdough Saloon to celebrate our survival the only logical way, by drinking a shot of whiskey with a dismembered human toe in it. So the story goes that back during the Klondike Gold Rush, one of the miners got caught in a blizzard and lost a toe to frostbite. His friends threw it in a jar of whiskey, thinking they could preserve it until the next doctor came to town, and they kind of forgot it was there, and, well, you can see where this is going. To this day, the Sourdough Saloon has had over 25 new toes donated, which I think raises more questions than it answers. Autumn could not be talked into this one, but I couldn't be talked out of it, and I think it makes the perfect ending, or should I say footnote, to a trip where nothing really went right, but for some reason, I'll always think back on it fondly. Huge thank you to the Journal of Lost Time, Feathered Friends, and Duder for making this project possible. Huge thank you to Ranger Nate for his support and assistance, and of course, huge thank you to Autumn for literally helping to carry me out of the wilderness. Thank you all for watching. I'll see you next time. <laughs>